Hello everyone and welcome to Third Age Total War Divide and Conquer version 4.5. Oh, it has been a long time since we've played this game. So, let's talk about what we're going to be doing. Firstly, before we actually get into the game, there's one thing that I um, want to show you as what's going to be one of the main features of this game. You have two different kinds of campaigns. You have the normal War of the Ring, which says here, play the War of the Ring main campaign, or choose a custom campaign. And currently there's only one, which I have shown off as a sub-mod in the past, but they have now patched it into the game properly, called the Shatt Shattered Alliances campaign. In Shattered Alliances campaign, every nation starts as neutral with every other nation. There are no starting wars and no starting alliances. You are free to play exactly how you wish. Note that certain scripts are also disabled so that you aren't forced into wars when you don't want to be. That um, won't affect us, as we are playing the Dwarves of Ered Luin, if it weren't very obvious by the title. And we're going for the long campaign victory. We're going to hold 50 regions. If we're going to actually hit that um, campaign victory, it's up to you. Do you want? How long do you want to see this campaign? How much are you enjoying this campaign? Leave likes, comments... Or just simply watching the, the video itself is enough for me to tell me, yes, you guys want to see more of this campaign. You want to keep seeing more of the one of the most advanced factions of the game. With one of the newest um, script overhauls, which gives them a bit of variance. But as I have mentioned in the previous video, we're going to be taking a little bit of a different route to what you've seen from every other YouTuber that has previewed the Dwarves of Ered Lewin on 4.5 or version 4. So let's get in because this does take a while. So what makes the Dwarves of Ered Lewin so different to let's say the Dwarves of Erebor which you played about a year ago? That is a good question random viewer. The real answer the answer is the Dwarves of Erebor, Ered Lewin and Khazadum have always been different to some respect. They have however been made more separately unique with the most recent updates, where Ered Lewin is more of a stand the ground with pikemen and shoot with crossbowmen. Kazadoom is a more all-round um, powerful faction with decent archers, but where it shines is in its armor piercing abilities in the late game, and probably the strongest armor stats in the game because you get the mithril mail which you uh, currently another faction can get unless they take um, Moria and Erebor is a bit of a wild card in that it has several allies such as Dale for cavalry, the Orakani for just some extra troops and obviously being close by to Ered Mithrin and Gundabad means they get their more un standalone unique units that every other dwarf faction can get but they are more likely to get them. So, the Grimborn. This is part of the script which is incorporated into only the Ered Luin faction. Since the awakening of the dwarves in the first age, two clans have called the Blue Mountains home, the Firebeards and the Broadbeams, which are what are predominantly our faction, Firebeards and Broadbeams. However, in the darkness, there are those who have been exiled among the dwarves, even in the west, called the Grimborn. And they are, let's say, they are jealous of the Noldor's crafting in the first stage. Because it was um, the time before Telkar, where the, the dwarves had not exceeded the elves in blacksmithing, or just smithing in general, construction, um, the finer arts. And so they created, well, um, the dwarves created for the High King of, um, I don't remember the region, but it's in here somewhere. I think it's Doriath. Yep, they created the uh, Norglamir, an elven necklace that was given to, it says here somewhere, ah, King Fingal of Doriath, if I'm not mistaken. And yep, uh, there was apparent, they were, well, in the law of this, it was sta it stated that they were Grimborn upon the, uh, the dwarves that helped fashion the necklace, which made the other dwarves decide this this beautiful necklace is not worthy of the elves. We should keep it for ourselves along with this Silmaril. 
as payment for creating such a beauty. But obviously, Fingal wasn't sure about that, and that led to the dwarves and elven animosity. And so, all the elves of Doriath were slain by the Grimborn and other dwarves, but the Grimborn were then basically exiled and shamed upon for their um, betrayal of their kin. However, none of the other dwarves knew that it was the Grimborn that caused the um, that caused all of this. It is simply stated that the elves and dwarves have just a natural hatred for one another because of what happened in the first age. However, in what 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 makes this script more not as history themed but campaign themed is that the Grimborn can return with their leaders growing in strength, ready to rise up upon the dwarves, but they first need reason to. And that will come up in a few years, around turn 40, which I'll talk about more in the future. But currently, the, the, the Grimborn that currently exist are small little packs that aren't known to anyone, very well hidden, ba basically spies among dwarves. Not spies for Melkor, not spies for Sauron, just spies that for dwarves that seek supremacy over the... Not just the, the dwarves that are currently ruling over the Ered Luin, but over all of the world. So yeah, enough of that. <laughs> oh, I was a bit out of breath there. I forgot to mention the first um, thing, that's like, like the Welcome to Divine and Conquer. You, you, know, get no, no, you know about this and this and this. We'll go over each of them eventually. So, Erelune to start with, we have three regions, Forens Halls, Gehuzanar, and Fahamgothol. And we start with a very small treasury and we make very little money. It's not because our uh, re regions aren't making enough money, because believe me, making a thousand each per region is massive. But it's because most of our troops are currently not free upkeep and they are very expensive. So it's the Firebeard Warriors, our best starting infantry unit, which we're going to put those send straight to Foreign Halls, because they get free upkeep here, because we can recruit them here. And we can get, we have up to three free upkeep. But also we have our faction leader here, Clan Lord Gore, and two Dwarven Labourers, which we're going to send up to the Hamgothol to join with our Clan Herald, Grain. And he will form an army that will be ready to start expanding our territory. But not yet. To start with, we're just going to sit back and relax because, as I've already mentioned, diplomacy-wise, no one is at war with anyone and no one is allied with anyone. All they want to do right now, oh, pardon me, is fight the rebels, expand, grow in strength. And that is what we should do as well. For if we're to just simply expand out like this is a normal campaign where we start fighting Angmar, etc., etc., then we just really will fall behind. We want to have a very good, dependable start. So we're going to start by building the mines in Foreign Halls. Dependable 629 resources per extra resources per turn is really good. But now we're almost out of money. But as I've already mentioned, we need free upkeep. So we're going to get the pipe hall in Gahuzanar. So Na, our gen one of our generic generals, who has our uh, general's bodyguard Tumunzaha nobles, is going to quickly move out for a second, build a tower, so we have a little bit more vision, and then set down the tax rate a little bit, so we're not going to have any rebellions. Next, we have our Lord Gore, which we're also going to move out, and he is probably. One of the most expensive starting units, the, the Gabil Gafol Guard, 500 upkeep. But it's not worth thinking, okay, we need to send him to a, a fort somewhere far in the front lines and he'll be, then be good because we'll be saving money, right? Wrong. You can actually get Gore to have such a high acumen, acumen which is basically your um, ability to rule a settlement, and enough traits and retinues you actually can have foreign halls make more than 500 a turn extra from having Goring. Because currently you make an extra 100. So currently Gore costs only 400 ex um, that's going outwards. An expenditure. And we're also 
uh, as I've said, once we get the mines, Gore can give even more because he's a dwarf. He gives extra mining income, by extra 5%. Yeah, that's not much to start with. But when you can get t uh, up to three tiers of mining, I can find the mines here, which makes 1,500. 5% 5 of that is nothing to slouch at. That's a good 100 right there. That's a good 100 just from having him in there. So he, he will pay for himself, trust me. And finally, we have our Clan Herald, who has another unique bodyguard. So I'm up a little further, so we have a tower here. And his bodyguard is the Broadbeam Marksman, our best crossbow unit. And as I've already said, um, Ered Lewin are crossbow focused units. You don't get any archers through recruitment, you can get archers through, um, through mercenaries, as you saw with the Ered Lewin scouts a few seconds earlier. But that is not what we're looking for. We're currently making near to no money, so if we move out and try to attack our enemies, we will just fall behind. In fact, I'm going to put you in here because you're not getting free upkeep. I can set that back up there, so I'm making an extra 100. Every coin counts in the beginning of the game. Some factions, you have no choice, like the Dunedain I showed off. You had to constantly be preparing to expand and fight off because all your starting regions, other than Faunus and Numenas, once you claim them, are villagers. Very small, undefended villagers which you can't really protect. The dwarves are the exact opposite on the exact opposite spectrum. They can just sit back and relax because they're in the nice corner of the map. And as I didn't mention in the last my, in my last video, which I'm now gonna say again here, once we get to the end turn, which I think is now oh wait, I want to build a building for Hamgafar, I want to build a Stonemasons Guild. Stone Workers Guild even. Or do I? Do I want pigs? Do I want baby piglets? Or do I want everything to cost less? I want everything to cost less. Okay, and um, now for the moment of truth. Will the game crash on turn one? Hopefully not. So, the object, as I've already said in this campaign, we're going up against the world. But, I am allowed, I'm allowing myself one ally. Because that is, is thematic when the script kicks in. And they're my close, and they're the closest faction to me, which I don't want to declare war on. Because again, most people who have done this campaign already have gone straight against the high elves. They've just completely trounced them, and there's then really no chance because you have all the extra money coming in from Mithlond, Forlond, Harlond, and then you just take Buzzardoom, and you have the entire we the northern western area of the map. And you just make insane amounts of money and then you win. We're kind of going for a half and half here. We're going to ally with the High Elves. Because the fact... the um, For those who have already already know of the Ring script for the Dwarves of Ered Lewin. If you reject the Rings, the High Elves will bless you with knowledge of shipcraft. And you can even get recruit Elven units. And I'm not sure if you don't already know... But I love the elves with a... It is a great love I have for the high elves. And just elves in general. So that's where we're sending our diplomat straight away. We're going to get... Make sure we come straight straight away. Good friends. that They would want to become our allies. And then we'll have military access. So we can prepare to move down to Buzzard Doom. Because that's the second point of this campaign. Even though we don't have the Buzzard Doom Reclamation script, because that's coming in in version 5. I wanted to do this before the Buzzard Doom Reclamation script came in. Because one, I want to get Divine and Conquer started up again. I love this game. It's hard for me to say that I hate, that I hate it, because I really do love it. But it, it is just so frustrating playing Total War games sometimes. And then making one small mistake, which causes the whole game to go in a perpetual... Mo the perpetual loop of bad occurrences happening over and over and over again. I should get a spy, but I have no real need for one, nor a diplomat currently. One diplomat's fine for now until we've start expanding either north or south of our dip with our diplomacy. Saying diplomat a lot. Um, don't have enough money to recruit, but as you can see, compared to what we had, like making 200 a turn, we're now making 600 a turn. And we're now also going to increase the tax rate by uh, one to high taxes. That makes us an extra 100 with still good public order. So now Gore 
cost even less. I'd say now cost 300 in expenditure. Which can also be checked if you just... Like that. Okay, so it's, so it's not actually giving us 100. An extra 100 in ex, um, out, of, out of his expenditure. But because of him being there, we are having a positive population growth. So we're getting more... Uh, residents joining in two foreign halls, which isn't, too, which, isn't, which isn't too important. We probably want that most into uh, Gahuzanar because this is only a small town or a mine as it's known to the dwarves. <gasps> and I think it's time to end the turn again. If everything has been moved, maybe just build one more tower. No, 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 no. Don't need to build any more towers. We want to prepare an army. But we want to make sure we're making money first. Because the army that I'm going to be building is going to be part merchant uh, troops. So it's the merchant cavalry and the uh, Erebor, not Erebor, the Dwarven Travellers. Because even though our troops are good, they also are expensive. Granted, yes, cavalry and normal archers are expensive too. But those are the two things we lack. Archers that aren't cro um, uh, dwarves that actually uh, wield bows instead of crossbows because let's face it the crossbows are good But they're not as good as bows when it comes to like friendly fire. They are ooh. <laughs> oh You gotta be careful But I have to admit the dwarven cross Okay first game crash first video edit whatever whatever we're fine. We're good. We're back in so we built the pipe hole in the stone mason's hall. So we're now having an extra 320 with Nar being there. We should probably get the stone workers hall here now as well. For Hammerfall, we can get the pipe hole, but I uh, don't really want. I want the pig farm. Uh, can I get my diplomat to speak to the elves this turn? No. Oh, I need to save some money somehow. Maybe I don't get this this turn. Maybe I get something else instead. Dead. Oh, but now I can't get something here. Oh dear, 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 dear. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? You know what? I'll save up for the turn because I'm gonna get some good money coming in. The hunger fall can save up a little bit more, and then we can get the pig farm. Because once the, the mines come in. Here and then eventually at Fahamgafol, we will be rolling in the money. Yeah, let's not worry about spending anything else right now. Don't need any more units. We're fine on units. We just want quests to then take either to take regions or to speak to certain factions. So we can get things like military units or just extra money. Either works for me. Let us end the turn. Carry on. Keep on keeping on. We could save up money from this point until we can get the mines in for Hamgafol. But that will, I believe they will cost around 4000 still. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's a smart thing to do. Could be, the, could be the right thing to do. Not sure if it's the smart thing to do. Because you know me, like to play smart when applicable. Which is 99% of the time. So... Do, 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 do. Quests. Speakers of the high, I was 750 coin. Yes. That might make it worth saving for the mines. Early mines is early dough. Hello elves. Do you want trade rights? Great. Do you want my, my, my map information as a gift? Do you want an alliance? Do you want military access? Perfect! We now have the perfect ally with all the requirements we need of them. Military access, full alliance, they know about our map information so they don't need to worry about that, I guess. That, that was just to increase our friendship. And that is it. That's the last faction we're going to be friendly with when it comes to trade. Or just, um, and talking to them. Okie dokie. I do want to keep some money left over so I can get the troops I need. Three turns until the mines are done at Foreign's halls. I could build a pig farm. I probably should build a pig farm. Apparently it's going to upgrade when it hits 4,000 population. I don't believe it can because it's already at a fortress. And that's the highest it can be. Don't need the brewery because I already have almost perfect dwarven culture. 
The mines are an extra currently 450, no, 41, no, 461, which would mean it would take about 12 turns to pay back. I can get them next turn, can't I? You know what? I'm going to get the mines. I'm going to hold back a little bit longer and we're going to get the mines because I feel ballsy tonight. Let's do it. Oh, ho, ho. we are going very fast into our economic strong points. Let's just hope no one expands our way anytime soon, Breland or Angmar. The two fragments I feel like I'll be fighting the most this campaign start. Dunedain, not really. I don't see myself fighting them at all, if possible. Because obviously everyone's got no alliances, so Dunedain and Bree could just go to war with each other if they wanted to. I have no reason to want to fight the Dunedain. They are an incredibly difficult faction for us to beat. Speak to the Bree Landers for 750 coin. I can do that. I can do that indubitably. Making sure I'm using, my, using the English in the right wet tense. I am. Good. Anyway, set the mines. There's going to be one turn less on that timer because we built the stone workers hall, which reduces times and cost for all buildings. So in not, not, about 80% of the time, you want to build this building first. But when, you're, when you've got a new um, region right on the front line, or you just want to go straight for mines, like I did in Foreign's Halls, it is more important to go for the mines first. The money you make from the mines is worth more than the money you'll save by building the Stone Workers Hall first, and the time you'll miss, the time you'll miss, that one turn you miss, will more than likely pay back the money you will lose by building the Stone Workers Hall first. That's what I've learnt in the past when it comes to building mines. Always get the mines first if possible. And I think that's just another end turn. No reason to push out, no reason to move anywhere. Everyone is happy and free to do as they please. We've got one more turn on the pig farm and one more turn, no, two more turns on the mines. So the rest of the money we'll be spending in the Huzanar next turn. Let's go. We will move out for Garth Heligoth. I just don't want to right now because. Um, our clan herald is saving us 200 more coin by keep staying, sitting in for Hangerfall. And the pikemen that are sitting there also give us more money. I don't want to make some of those pikemen too before moving out. I want to have two units of pikemen, um, the, those two labourers, merchant cavalry, the Eridluan scouts in Gehuzanar, clan herald grain, and the dwarven travellers. That army will be enough to extinguish almost all foes. A few things you may not have seen, but there are there were a few um like changes on the map. I think that was the grain mill. I'm not sure. That might have just been this, uh, a bit of the season changing again. Not quite sure, but I did see something change. That's because we got the pig farm. At least it's one I want to believe. So it means that we got. I think that might um relate to these villagers. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I don't play. I haven't played Medieval Two back in its vanilla day, so I'm not that well versed in the small coding idiosyncrasies of the faction. Now we will probably have to build these Eridluan militia as well, because I want to have something. We need something left in for Hammerfall, even if it's just one trashy unit that's been half killed off. We still need something. So let's just go to Mitchell Delving and speak to the Breelanders. I want trade rights. Thank you for the money. I want map. I want your, you to pay me for my map information. Give me four hundred coin, and I'll give you all my maps. Thank you. Your four hundred. Your donation is admirable, amiable, accepted, etc. <laughs> oh, what next? I probably want the Stoneworkers Guild next in Foreign's Halls. It's a city, so it does have a wide building roster compared to the fortress of the Hanger Fall. Uh, got the mines here. We will actually get the Eridluan uh, infantry this... Actually, no. We'll get it next turn. Because that way we can save ourselves 600 coin. And I think another 320. Yeah, 320. Because when the unit comes out, they still have you just have to pay for them. Because it's the turn they come out. Kind of the opposite of what they do with the Turtle Warhammer. 
if that makes any sense to people that are watching. Uh, no. Let's get the spine now. Let's get the spine now. I'm going to get the Stoneworkers Guild Hall even. Next. And Bahamgafold doesn't need any other buildings. So we're making good, we're making 1,500 now. In five turns, we might have, um, uh, multiply our income per turn times 10. We're about to cut it that by half because of what we're... Because of what we need to do to move out and expand and empower our um, ever-growing empire. But it is, it is a good step in the right direction. It is a very good step in the right direction. Okie dokie. No crash. Good. Another trait. In line of sight. Oh, we've got our... New spy, right? Fundin. Let's have. We already know what's down here. The re, the forest land of Perthenlun. The Loon Lands. Western Numelia Door. Which we do want. That is another very good region for us to take. But Garth Helagoth is also a good region for us to take. Before anyone else moves closer to us. The first war has been declared. The High Isles versus the Goblins of Moria. I think Gondor and Dunamar have gone to war. Or Gondor and Mordor. They always go to war. Really? No? Wow. Normally Gondor and Mordor go to war or war with each other in the first few turns. Very good. Very good to see that change. Okie dokie. We have good money. Let's not spend it because we can spend it later for better buildings and such. Let's get Erdlewin Militia. Alright, we need the merchants. We're going to get merchants, right. I'm going to sit out just at here and we can see Garth Helagoth. Have the scouts move in behind us. And have grain prepared to move out. We're going to purchase. We're going to purchase them next turn. Again, just to save a little bit extra money. It is worth it. And then they will not go because no one else is here to steal them from us. And now look at Foreign's Halls. Already making 2600 from high tax rates. That's really good. And if we take Gore out, he's now making us fr nearly 300. So about 250 coin. So he's paying for half of his upkeep, which is really good to say that he, that again, he is probably our best infantry unit currently, but he is so much better as a governor. That's the thing you need to remember. Some uh, generals are better as leaders, some are better at, uh, some are better as uh, frontline generals, some are better as settlement protectors, and some are better as, um, should probably set that down a bit. Yeah. One public order and uh, population growth in Gahuzanar more than anywhere else. So we should probably invest in the large pig farm next. Although, no, nah, the mines here aren't worth it. We just need, we just, we just want this region to grow. And we probably want some uh, correct culture too. So we'll get the brewery next in Gahuzanar. Let's have our spy Anar, not our, our spy, our diplomat Anar, move up to Anumina to speak with the Dunadine. Who get a massive plethora of troops and regions to start with compared to what you have when you start as a northern Dunadine. Which is why they're again one of the most well liked factions of the dwarves. I keep wanting to say the Dowie because I've been playing so much Total Warhammer. Specifically the Dwarves. They are so fun. They're probably the most balanced faction in the game because of the fact they don't use magic. Magic is a very... to and fro... thing. In that game. Uh, do, 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 do. Yep. Yeah. Gonna have 2800 next turn. And how much of that is gonna be going into mercenaries? 1250. Okay. Good. Let's keep going. Let's us get going. For Hamberfall has got three or two turns left on the mines. So they'll soon be making an extra 400 a turn. Which is, I must say... You, you may think mines having a set income amount that never rises or deplenishes with like population over time or trade is good to start with but then really bad in the late game. No, it's just, that, it's just good all around. Because it pays itself off really quickly 
Because, which is why regions that have mount, uh, just mountainous regions in general are always better. Oh, we can get military units from Taunton and Dunedine. Yes, please. I also want you to pay 400 for some map information. Some of you may be thinking, oh, this is so cheesy. He's getting money from just giving them nothing that they don't already know. Blah, blah, blah. Well... Firstly, only because the AI doesn't do it doesn't mean I can't do it. And secondly, it's not like I'm asking them for 600 or 1,000, which half the time doesn't work, but still. I'm not paying them for um, absorbent amounts. I'm only asking them for small pittances. They can, I can pinch from their pockets every now and again. So, Gahuzanar, what do I want for you? We could get the large pig farm. It's gone down by an extra 300 coin thanks to the stone workers' hall. And a turn. And, as I've already mentioned, you do get growth from the farming buildings, but this is the, uh, this, the last tier of farming you can get as the dwarves, as shown here on the livestock, sea trade marketplace, mines, leisure. Where is it? Where is it? Why well, can't I see it? Why am I blind? Why can't I? Why can't food production? That's it. You only get pig farm and large pig farm. You do not get anything else other than those two buildings, which you may, um, which is a, a way to basically stop the dwarves from having too much growth, because the later tiers of um, mining also gives you um, growth. If I just scroll over. Here, the mining network, you get culture bonus and population growth because the mines are where the dwarves spend most of their time. If, I, if I'm to quote Alice in Wonderland, hi ho, not Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> oh, not Alice in Wonderland, um, Snow White, hi ho, hi ho, it's off to work we go. They're happy to mine, they love mining. Some factions like the Easterlings or Umbar might use um, just lower. Uh, lower class peoples or slaves to do their uh, do their bidding in the mines. But no, the dwarves, they happily send all kinds of peoples into their mines because they all enjoy mining. They have mining songs and all. Now then, the garrison of Goth Heligoth is a threat if not prepared properly against, which I have prepared properly for, with the merchant cavalry to clean up the woodland hunters when they start coming out of the settlements. The bandits can be easily cleaned up by the travellers and our pikemen. And Clan Herald Grain and the Ered Lewin Scout Crossbowman units are very good contenders against the Cell Swords. Wooden Hunter, the Lumbermen are. Yeah, they, they, they can just die to anything. For total defence, just shoot them. They die. Bandits, not so much. That's why we have pikemen. And the Cell Swords get to get crumbled over by everything. Because armour piercing, armour piercing. I could get more things from this if I wanted to I should probably get some uh, yeah. I could get some more merchant cavalry but look how expensive they are and look how much money I'm now making we've, we've gone we've gone down to 600 per turn which will soon be going up to a thousand a turn which is good it's very good a lot of growth coming in Gahuzanar we need 5,000 population before we can upgrade again and until that point, all the buildings we see here are basically it. This is all we can get. We can't get any further buildings or well, building tiers after that. Gehuzanar and Foreign's Halls, they have no end to buildings. So having all the buildings built like the Stoneworkers Guild is important. Oh yeah, speaking of guilds, there was there used to be a construction guild that the dwarves had that gave them a uh, local construction cost reduction and then a global construction cost reduction that has been removed and with good reason because the dwarves already do so much construction re uh, cost reduction with the with the building actually being there the new um stone mate the new um, builders huts and the dwarves actually their their normal trait being a dwarf reduces construction costs and if you get the Elastilian stone and any of the Palantiri that still exist I believe there's four one two three four yes oh no five there's five Palantir left oh no four left because the Palantir of Ithil got moved to Baladur 
Then we have uh, the Gon the Anor Stone and the Ithil, not uh, the Anor Stone, the Orphanx Stone. And then finally we have the um, Elostilian Stone. If we have all of those under our control, I believe that's a full 20% construction cost reduction faction-wide. Actually, no, I don't, I don't think that's faction. No, but it's faction wide because then it also gives another construction cost reduction. Yeah, the dwarves love building things. We could get the merchant cavalry or some bandits, but we don't need infantry. We've got plenty of already high value infantry. They're just kind of serving you down. Half the cost of dwarven laborers, and yeah, they're slightly better for the cost. But no, don't need more infantry because we've got. We've got plenty of infantry. We have infantry and spades, but the dwarves are crying out loud. And my throat is giving way already. Let's get the grain exchange. Because we're trading with our direct partner, and they have good trade too, the grain exchange pays itself off in less than 10 turns, because it makes an extra 50 from the buildings, an extra 8 from admin, and an extra 81 from trade. So that's paying about uh, 120 a turn. And since it only costs 630, take three turns off of that. Well, add three turns onto that. It takes about 10 turns to pay itself off. And then, just, then you're just making an extra 120 coin a turn. Which then increases with trade and taxes and admin. So we have a spy. Let's us go down and see if we can find the region of Osgalon. In eastern Numeliador. And dear God, my throat is already giving way. <laughs> Oh dear, that's not good. So, we've got two more turns before Goth Heligoth will rise up against us. I think next turn I will recruit that other unit of Merchant Cavalry, if I have the money for it. Oh, I forgot to move the Gossip. Oh, we got the Gossip trait. Oh, no. Yeah, if you get the Gossip trait or, like, utterly indiscreet, you just lose your influence. So, factions are less likely to agree to your... Um, uh, when, when you speak uh, diplomatically to another, like diplomats, or there's another general, in, uh, in another uh, uh, to a lord in general, um, you lose out on ch the chance of actually persuading them to agree to your um, demands. Which means I'm less likely to make some money. But again, not going to abuse the money system you can get through uh, map information selling. Only using it in the starting portions of the game. Once I've spoke to every faction and got map information from every faction, that's it. That's all I need. Then diplomats are just around to um, be basically slightly cheaper and less valuable spies. <laughs> that is it. That's all they do. They just sit there and be annoying. Maybe trade some regions off to some uh, to the allies of the High Elves. Because we want to protect the High Elves as much as possible. As I've said, we are allying with no other faction. Dwarves of Khazadum and Erebor, watch out because I'm coming for you. And there will be no remorse for when I kill you. And as you can see, we got an extra 400 more than what was originally projected because the mines of Ahamgafol were completed before the end turn. So the end turn then swoops in, we get the extra 400. If that makes sense to you guys. Always make sure you know what buildings are about to be completed because you will get more extra money from them. Speaking of... I should get the pig farm instead of the merchant cavalry. I should survive without the merchant cavalry, right? Oh, someone bought the bandits. Oh. Oh. Oh, Angmar has already taken oil ad. Oh, dear. They are not... They do, I did not expect them to take that that quickly. It's only turn 10. Actually, no, it is turn 10. Oh, my. Yeah, let's get the merchant cavalry then. We need the extra units. Have both units of cavalry to step out for a second and then come back in to align themselves correctly. Uh, ooh, 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 ooh. We are in a little predicament, ladies and gentle folk. Because Angmar is on our doorstep, and I do not think I will uh, be able to avoid wanting to declare war on them. Because, yeah, they've already stolen bandits from me that I could have bought, but never would have bought. But they still bought them instead of me. Bought. Anyway, here we go. Turn 11. First battle of the day. Not sure how long I'm going to make these videos. I'm just, I'm undecided on when I, if I want to just keep going in one long period for like three hours and then cut them into three, uh, to three one-hour in, um, uh, individual videos. 
or if I just want to um, just do one video, stop, do another video, stop, do another video, stop. It's, I mean, I'm not really going to have a break from anything, so I might as well just continue. And then at a certain point, I'll stop and say something so I actually know when to stop or maybe before battle starts, I don't know. So let us begin. Ered Luin Battle. And let us attack. Grond they named it, in memory of the hammer of the underworld of old, which by the way is uh, Morgoth's Warhammer. Grond. That's what they named it after. That's the hammer of the underworld. Yep, Gandalf is looking as puzzled as half of you probably are. Okay. Pikeman, we want you smack dab in the center. Maybe with a little gap in the center so I can use the... I'm just going to pause for a second so I can get everything lined up correctly. So I'm going to want my broadbeam marksman on the right shooting their troops. I want the cavalry. Oh, cavalry on both sides. That's good. Cavalry on one side. Cavalry on the other side. I want my Eridluin scouts in the center of the two pikemen to shoot through without doing friendly fire. I want the Eridluin scouts to the left. So, actually, no, I don't really need them to the left, but just here, for example. So they're protected. And then I want the laborers on the left and right to protect the archers and to protect the broad, broads beam marksmen. I'm going to say so many different names wrong in this campaign. It's going to be hilarious. Let's get on with it. Everyone but the cavalry sit in guard stance. Green, let's put you together with the archers so I know when to command group you. Or just to select all you at once. Lumbermen have come through first. Can my scouts begin the attack? Not yet. Are oh, they turning left? Are they turning right? Are the wooden hunters out? They are out. Okay, I should prepare to strike at the wooden hunters first. Have the bandits get shot at by Grain. Oh yeah, don't fire at will. Do not fire at will. Because otherwise they could shoot something I don't want them to shoot. Like that, for example. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, shoot the lumbermen, because they got weak armor, but armor piercings, so they're a little bit annoying. Merchant cavalry first charge into the wooden hunters, sending them flying around them, already shaken from the first charge against this relatively weak charging cavalry. Now let's move them back out, make sure other merchant cavalry is safe. Move them further back. Now the thing about merchant cavalry is they have zero defensive skill because they're literally just merchants who have been paid with uh, to have wear heavy armor. But let's face it, any unit on a horse in med med two is going to be good, whether if it's whether it's militia or not, it is always going to be good. Let's move the scouts slightly further forward. Or tra I'm going to keep getting the names of the scouts and travelers mixed up. I do not care. It's going to happen. Just accept it. Cavalry move back out again before they can get in a strike. Because the Wooden Hunters have a free melee attack against 14 total defense. And as I said, no defense skill, all in armor. 12 armor. And 2 in shield because, again, they're not good in, in melee. But their charge is pretty reliable. Which is going to actually get even better in future versions because of the new changes they've been making. If the, if anyone hasn't actually read up on that yet. Those, hun those hunts are still there. And the more hunts are coming in. Yes, strike them down. Oh, this is perfect. They just put all their archers into one location for me to shoot them. It's perfect. Go on, men. Oh, send them flying. Made them regret coming out of their huts. Oh my god, these guys have gotten so many kills. And not a single kill on the, my merchant, militia, uh, merchant cab yet. That's perfect. Where are their cell swords? Where are they? I do not see them. Oh, there they are. Okay, Broadbeam, Scouts, shoot the cell swords. Wait for the cell swords to leave before I shoot the hunters. Okay, don't let them hit my 
crossbows because they will if I don't move. Come on. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Laborers deal with those bandits. Cavalry charging the back of those bandits. You shoot the lumbermen because they're still biggest threat. Broadsbeam marksmen prepare to turn to the right. Well done, merchant cavalry. Losing only two men and killing a reasonable number of 200-ish woodland hunters. Well done. Broadsbeam marksmen, I need you to the side so you can start striking. Summoners of the dwarves don't know what it does. Don't really care. You will learn in future versions what it does. And look at that. Their men are already routing. Lumberman close on the verge of routing. Bandits charging the back. They're already wavering and broken. Their leader has no hope against us. Although granted, cell swords are a very dangerous unit. But still, they stand no chance. They have lost half their men. I'm not sure if this is too, if the announcer is too loud or too quiet. He is a bit quiet on my end. If you can't hear him and you want to hear him, just um, leave a comment down below. If the sound of anything is too loud or too quiet, I'll try to adjust it. I always, for some reason, get complaints on Divide and Conquer videos. Like, oh, the microphone's too quiet. Oh, the music's too loud. Oh, well, at least I did in the past. I've made a good few changes in the uh, since then. Oh, look at those crossbow bolts. Trained and ready to fire from our broadsbeam marksmen. The elite of the elite. Although not fashioned the heaviest of armor, are very deadly foes to fight. And one of our apparent one of our apparently one of our best units. Merchant cavalry charging to the bandits. And look at the the ever doing pikemen. A stout line, fierce and unbreakable. Fully armed and filthy. All of our archers focus on the cell swords now. Have the cavalry clean up the bandits. And look at that. Only lost seven percent of the army. And that's mainly in labourers. And labourers, we do not care if they die. Because they are the cheapest and most sufficient of our people. And the cell swords doing not too good. Oh, you're still fighting. Oh, the general of the cell swords is in there. Oh. Okay, get those labourers out if possible. That he should then reform with the unit. There, there we go. And then just focus him down. He should eventually rout or die. Whichever one happens first is irrelevant. Okay, you guys can all stop now. Make sure to press stop on a few times when uh, stopping. Because otherwise your unit might try to stop. But then start again. You're always going to make sure you make... You basically interrupt your um, unit several times. Losing only 73 men. And most of them sustained for the laborers. Some pikemen were killed. 10 and 19, but a good number of them were healed. And then some more dwarven laborers took some hits. Merchant cavalry, only one died because two were healed. Oh, that is beautiful. And 150 prisoners caught with 213 casualties inflicted. Oh, yes. All the dwarves need are, cav are decent cavalry, and they just become unkill. They just become unstoppable. Oh, look at him there! <laughs> Poor thing, he's about to get stabbed. Then he's got a giant nose, giant nose, giant nose, giant nose. This must have been the time during um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Good old big noses. <laughs> uh, I, I like to have little pokes and jabs at things like that. It's not malicious in any way, it's just fun. And I'm sure many people do the same. Look, it's a giant nose, but it's a goblin, so it's kind of fine. But he's kind of green, so is this Lord, is this Lord of the Rings or Warhammer? <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. I'm terrible. I know I'm terrible. Just try and stop me. Just try. Uh, I'm going to sack. reason why is because I want to keep the population under control. And we do not have a very good presence in the sty. Oh, candidate. Azaghal. Adopted, natural administrator, so good, a very good acumen, a skilled bureaucrat. He is perfect for putting into Gar Palawak. He's a bit lazy. I'll admit he's a bit lazy, but take his acumen into account, and he is very good. Good renown. He's a dwarf and a long beard, but that doesn't, again, do much. Yeah, let's accept him as a candidate for adoption and move Azaghal to Garth Helagoth.
And we will go straight into the Stoneworkers Hall here. Even though I said before, sometimes you don't want to do it when it's in the front line, yada, yada, yada. But I, I, make, it, I make an exception sometimes. Oh, they've already got their elite troops? Oh, right, they always... They always, for some reason, start with a, a band of their elite troops. I've played a lot of this in the background. Kazadoom and Lothlorien are at war. Oh, ho. Oh, ho, ho. I want to see how that ends. If it means Kazadoom dies and I have no reason to fight them, but I can claim vengeance upon those who dare kill, claim my kill. <laughs> oh, yes. So we're going to go for Stoneworkers Hall and then straight into the Pipe Hall so we can keep Azaghal in free upkeep in Garth Helagoth. But next we need to consider where to go from here. And how much can we set, leave, uh, take out or leave in? We can take all but one unit of labourers. That I will live with. Our grain, start moving now. We're now at the point where we want to start moving a lot. To start claiming the land. Now, do we want to move that? No, we want to go up here. Because there's a small rebel army here and they annoy you if you don't clean up there first. And then th this battle here becomes ten times more difficult. 11 turns in, no idea how long I've been recording for, but I'm going to keep up for a little bit longer. Just before we fight the army here, and let's see, and we'll wait and see if Angmar tries anything tricksy our way as we march forward. So, oh, hello there. Yurik. Snow Orc re rebels, not rebels, um, recruits. The Iron Crown Longbowmen, yeah. Angmar is kind of a mockery of the Dunedain, with slightly less powerful units overall, but with a more Rudauer and Orcish theme. Which I prefer more than what they had before, which was completely Orc-based and very generic and boring. And I mean boring. And you, if anyone's watched my content, will know that. Oh, I can't quite talk to him yet with Anar. It's a shame. But he has got, oh, we got one more thing back. He's calm. He's calm and collective. Very good. I need a calm and collective diplomat. Anything else not being... Built anywhere? All right, for Hangerfall, let's get the pigs. Oink oink. We make only five hundred a turn. Oh, I think I might just go straight for the pipe hall then. No, no, Stoneworkers Hall. I'm paying even more for it now because I already moved grain out. Crap. Uh, uh, ah. Oh well. I'll live with it. I will live with the disappointment. Because we'll eventually lose some more troops, which means we get more money. So we can bet, get more units, get more troops, etc, etc. Plus we're going to get more money from Foreign's Hall soon. With the Grain Exchange, an extra 120 a turn. I should pay for what we need. Let's end the turn. I've talked enough. Let's end the turn. Also, I can get, extort some money from Angmar. Angmar, even though we all start neutral together... They don't tip generally like us because of our culture. Because that's another thing I found about this little sub-mod. Some factions, if you're the same culture, or if your cultures are allied in the base uh, War of the Ring campaign, they are more likely to like you. Not guaranteed you're not going to go to war with them, if you don't ally with them first. But it's something you have to consider. Followers of Melkor is normally... is generally hated by almost everyone so yeah we saw the relations abysmal a measure of how the faction feels about yours they do not feel very good about us but they prioritize trade so that makes them a little bit happier and i'm going to avoid war of angmar for now so i'm just going to gift them my map information so we've got some more heirloom militia in foreign hordes which is still free up keep because we have a total of three for your keep. We originally used to, ha we used to have five when Foreign's Halls also gave an extra two, but nah, you don't need it. I'll say you see. <laughs> two turns they lasted. Two turns of my happiness, and then it just disappeared. Of course it did. You bastards. Ah, oh, well, I can soon upgrade Goth Helagoth with the. Oh, get rid of that. Yeah, we're now back to making 800 over 500. So we're actually making even more money than we were. 
I could build the Ironmongers so I could get uh, the Dwarven Labourers and an extra 40 per turn. And only 540, that pays itself off in 13 turns. And you don't normally have, you don't normally build the Blacksmith to have it pay itself off. Just You get it because you want your upgrades, which typically aren't very valued. Because the Dwarves, you also get money from them and the units. They are generally more valued. But I, I think I'm just going to go for the Grain Exchange instead here in Gahuzanar because that's an extra 50, 100, 105. So that pays us off, off in 11 turns. That's not bad. That's not bad. Always thinking about the future because the future is ours to take. And we are close to starting war with what's well, claiming Perth and Lunn. Yep, all good, all good, all good. All good? Oh, you're right, I have to keep moving. Is that name Wes? I thought it said Wheeze. Like W H I S, you know, Dragon Ball. You guys are no fun. You don't you, you don't ever answer my funny remarks. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh spy Oh, they're moving down to I assume Barketta or Bar e Donio Rack. And with Captain Swibne 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 It's gonna stop. Some Thralls, Angrim Archers. The problem with Angmar is, come to, to fight, when fighting against the Dwarves, and vice versa, is that your army is very well defended against Archer Fire, but even though these guys only have free missile attack, it's still better than zero. And also, their early game is so much more powerful because they don't have, you don't have to worry about their armor pit, because you don't have to worry about armor piercing. Granted, your late tier units, yeah, you kind of need to worry about armor piercing of the dwarves. But the more thing, the thing you need to worry about when you're playing with the dwarves, when you're playing with Angmar, is archers and armor piercing and mobility. Those three things screw you over, which is why having things like ballista and catapults make the dwarves balanced in that regard when you're playing against them. But playing with them, you have to always watch out. I'm kind of repeating myself, so I'm going to end the turn now. All right, we have Azaghal moving up off to Goth Helagoth, which I will be getting the pipe hole for next turn. Okay, I feel like I've been doing this for a while. I am going to prepare to call it a day for this part. I've decided on what I'm going to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus Christ, my computer's at 34 degrees. Yeah, I'm going to end now before my computer blows a fuse and kills me. <laughs> Probably open a window, maybe get a fan, extra few fans in here. Maybe get a drink because my throat's actually get, starting to get a bit scratchy. Ugh. But all in all, good start. Very good start. All an extra thousand. Oh, I cannot complain about that. Okay, give me a war. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh. We're at war with each other. We're not war with each other. We're now allies. <laughs> and Lothlorien is now war allied to Rohan. So Lothlorien is going to become a very annoying faction to face if we face them. Might not. We might. Not sure. Not really decided on anything yet. So, one last check at everything before we call it a day. We could get the practice range. But I think I am going to invest in the Ironmongers. It's cheap, it's reliable, it's more money, and you can't go wrong with money. As we scout out our next prey, Captain Hyrian. And until next time, my friends, ta-ta for now.